Hello everyone and welcome back to uh, another little snippet of Manchester's history. I hope you've been enjoying them so far. Uh, so we've seen the, a tiny little hamlet become an important Roman hub, a medieval nowhere and then the cradle of industrialization. And then the canals came and Manchester was transformed into one of the most important towns in Europe and an exciting experiment in early stage capitalism. And now at last we've got to the exciting bit because it was here in Castlefield again where another chapter of Manchester's history was about to spill out and revolutionise the world. Now any visitor to Castlefield could be looking at a number of different historical things but one thing they can't fail to notice are these not one, not two, not three but six huge railway viaducts which cross this tiny little area. Transporting goods by rail wasn't a new idea. In fact, like the canals, rails had been used to transport people and goods in ancient times. But then steam power came along and made the idea a viable alternative to the road system. Thanks to pioneers in steam power such as Thomas Newcomb, James Watts and Richard Trevithick, steam engines were being developed that were strong enough to pull things from one place to another. With campaigning from Liverpool corn merchant Joseph Sanders and the owner of the largest spinning mill in Manchester, John Kennedy, the idea was floated for a railway between the two towns. Fresh from working on the Stockton and Darlington Railway and developing prototype steam locomotives, engineer George Stevenson was drafted in to provide a solution. After surveying a possible route and engineering ways to overcome the various obstacles, work was completed in 1830 on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway Line, the world's first intercity passenger railway. And there it is, Liverpool Road Station, the Manchester terminal of the world's first passenger railway line. Um, and it's the oldest surviving passenger station in the world and the first proper passenger station anywhere. Now I've looked at this in more detail about a video I've done about the Liverpool Manchester line so I highly recommend you check that out if this is the type of thing that interests you. But very briefly you can see that the station is two stories high and that's because the line is actually up there in line with the, the first floor. Um, principally because it had to be high enough to clear uh, the Irwell and allow shipping underneath but also because the land up here uh, was a bit raised for the sandstone bluff um, which is in the area of course it's not very prominent today but it's what the Roman fort was built on so they had a couple of geographical things to contend with and they ended up with a two story station so in order to bring the line into the city centre of Manchester they had to cross this the river Irwell um, and this is how they did it. This is the George Stevenson 1830 viaduct. Um, and it's another world's first, uh, the world's first viaduct to cross a major river. Now this whole area would have been chaotic with wagons and workers. Um, there were stables below the arches of the viaducts. This one here and then the later addition, which is this one, uh, the one that's knocked down over the Irwell. Stables beneath there. And further down there, there's a ramp um, which was built uh, primarily for livestock so that poor farm animals um, could be taken on and off the trains as they arrived. Now by the 1840s up to 80,000 pigs were brought into the city at this very point destined for slaughter. Um, uh, down there just south of the viaduct was a massive pig market and under there under the ramp itself um, was a slaughter room for the slaughter uh, workers so very nice. So in all this chaos they still had passengers arriving at the station and they had to cross the busy line up there um, to get down to street level and um, so they built an extension or they built an arrival station rather which is that building over there um, which eased sort of the foot congestion at the original Liverpool Road station so yeah arrivals would get off there and come out um, built just a few years after the line 1837 I think so 
after a while the original viaduct or its replacement at least and that one over there uh, we used just for goods traffic um, and it didn't take very long for that to happen uh, neither of them are used today actually um, both are just quite dead that one over there however and um, still a live railway line um, and it was built a little bit later in fact that bit there was brand new uh, 2017 i think that went up um, even though it looks it's rusty and horrible looking <laughs> Anyway, that's a live railway line, and that was built to join up the Liverpool line with the other side of the city because railways were developing on the other side of Manchester, leading to other parts of the country. Uh, and so now, to tell you about that, I've got to go back to Castlefield. Adjacent to the station is this huge warehouse, today part of the Science Museum and known simply as the 1830 Warehouse. Built in the style of the canal warehouses that came before it, the 1830 warehouse is the world's first railway warehouse. But more than that, it incorporates this nice bend, so it can sit right up against the bent railway line. It was framed with Baltic timber and had a unique steam-powered hoist system to move the goods from one floor to another. was such a success that a network was quickly built connecting major parts of Britain. Manchester was served by four main line stations. Liverpool Road, London Road, now Piccadilly, Hunts Bank, now Victoria, and Central, now closed. Two smaller stations followed at Deansgate and Oxford Road, and there were two goods depots, the Great Northern Railway Warehouse and Oldham Road. And to connect those southern stations, they built this. This is the viaduct at the Manchester Southern Junction and Ultragun Railway. And it's a phenomenal structure. It just goes on and on. By far the longest structure uh, in the city, even today. It takes the line all the way from Ardwick through Piccadilly Station, across Oxford Road and Deansgate, through the Roman Fort over there, and across the Canal Basin right here and connects up with the line into Liverpool Road Station, just beyond this building over there. Now, technically speaking, it's not all one viaduct. It's a series of viaducts connected by raw iron bridges. But taken as a whole, which it should be, it's one of the longest raised sections of railway in the UK. Right, let me see if I can remember this correctly. It's one and a half miles long, the 224 arches altogether. It's made of 50 million bricks, approximately, 300,000 cubic feet of um, stone and 3,000 tons of cast iron. It's a bloody beast. And it includes this brick archway behind me, which is so wide and skewed at such an angle that it's the only one of its type in the country. So the brick archways are nice enough. But just look at these iron ones. They're just beautiful. And they're totally symbolic of Manchester's railway heritage. In fact, this one here is my favorite. Look at the angle that is skewed on. It's almost lined up with the canal. I just love it, that is beautiful. And this is a perfect example of a new kind of problem railway engineers had to overcome. Unlike roads, railways can't bend at a nice 90 degrees to go over uh, another road or a waterway, a river or a canal. So they have to be skewed at an angle.
Station serving the south was a top priority and they built it here on London Road in 1842. Now to do so they had to clear row upon row of houses and they put the station up there on top of a viaduct. Now originally um, it only went a few miles south to Stockport and was simply called the Store Street Station. Expanded in the 1860s to include 14 platforms and a huge wrought iron roof it was a statement of intent for how the railway age was going to unfold. Bold, beautiful and ambitious. Oxford Road, today the city's second busiest station and also its most central, was built on the site of Little Ireland, an area of poor Irish immigrants living in some of the worst slum conditions imaginable. When the area was cleared, the station was built on top of the viaduct. This meant it couldn't be too heavy and therefore was built out of wood. However, it also had just one platform, serving each direction of travel, meaning that both passengers and goods shared a platform, a problem that was exacerbated by the increasing number of trains wanting to stop there. For a while, it was commonplace for passengers to alight some distance away from the station and walk the rest of the way to the platform. Meanwhile, the original Liverpool Road station was deemed too far from the city centre and after only 14 years of taking passengers, it closed. Instead, the line was rerouted to a new station called Hunt's Bank, which was the terminus of a new line to Leeds. Built in 1844, Hunt's Bank Station, now Victoria, was the city's main train station for many years, serving routes from the north, east and the west. A line to and from Leeds terminated at Oldham Road Station, which is no longer there, until Samuel Brooks, Vice Chair of the Manchester and Leeds Railway, bought land here and proposed a through station linking to Liverpool. Today, mostly the station has been gutted and ruined by mindless development over the years, but thankfully, a few original features still survive, including this wonderful face on the bend here. It was just one story high, but a second was added in the 1860s. Abutting Hunt's Bank, they built a second station, called Exchange. This was built because the two rival railway companies operating the lines around here couldn't quite agree on terms of sharing Hunt's Bank. So, the London and North Western Company built a separate station instead. In 1880, congestion forced the building of the last station in the city centre. This, what was known as Manchester Central Station. It's a classic looking station with its arched roof modelled on St Pancras in London. And with it came the addition of more lines into the city and therefore more massive viaducts. And another one was this one, the now abandoned Castlefield viaduct built with a classic castle turret design a fantastic iron monster that just dominates the scene around here So just behind where those cherry pickers are up there, where the trees are, that is the end of Castlefield Viaduct and the line would have branched right through here 
through the car park, along here, and then cross Dean's Gate, slap bang through the middle of the Beetham Tower, where that is today. Um, and it not only went to the central station, but it also went into the Great Northern Railway's warehouse uh, complex, which was next door, which was adjacent to the station. Now today, that's an entertainment complex, and to be honest, for the most part, a car park. But at the time, it was one of the largest railway uh, warehouse complexes in the country, in fact, anywhere. And it was built over the line of the Salford Junction Canal, uh, which we saw in the last video, meaning it was an interchange between canal, rail and road, uh, and had turntables on the, the lower two floors. Unlike the 1830 warehouse, this one was one of the first to pioneer the use of steel beams and was built with this wonderful Italianate exterior, now a landmark at the bottom end of Deansgate. Now the railways made Manchester a city of warehouses too. Uh, this tiny one behind me is actually a canal warehouse. Um, and it's the Dale Street Warehouse, built in 1806. Uh, and you can see the two holes there where uh, branches of canal went in for the boats to enter. And somewhere buried beneath the southern end over there is a giant um, cast iron water wheel. Um, still there, still survives today. And this one is a cracking warehouse. This is uh, just off Juicy Street and it's apartments today, but its scale is vastly different to the one on Dale Street. And this is a purpose-built railway warehouse uh, with rail access over there to Piccadilly Station or uh, London Road Station as it was. But it also does technically have a bit of canal access here with a branch coming off um, the Ashton Canal just over the other side of this fence. But there was a third type of warehouse, a commercial warehouse, where people would store and sell their goods. They became so common in Manchester that they generally became known, outside of Manchester even, as Manchester warehouses. Um, and many of them survive even still today. And a lot of them don't even look like warehouses. And of course, Manchester became a centre of railway manufacturing too. In 1848, engineer Richard Peacock and the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway Company had opened a large engineering works to the east of the city, known locally as Gorton Tank. Peacock then later left and partnered with German engineer Charles Bayer to open his own engineering works on a site adjacent to the first, Gorton Foundry. Just two miles or so from the city centre, Unbelievably, the area around Gorton and Openshaw was still pretty much green and open countryside, with plenty of room for expansion. Bayer Peacock & Co would transform this to be one of the busiest sites for locomotive production in the world. In the 1850s and 1860s, precisely when railway fever was gripping the world, the two sites manufactured hundreds of steam locomotives and their parts, exporting them all over the globe. The impact the railway network had on Britain cannot be overstated and can be seen in evidence in the growth of towns and cities up and down the country. Trains shrunk the world, created freedom and sped up other technological developments with a quick movement of material now possible. And they spread across the world too. Look at this map. This is every train line in the world today. All of them the descendants of that first pioneering line from Liverpool to Manchester. London Road Station was joined by a sister station, Mayfield, in 1910. The main station was renamed in 1960 to Piccadilly, and throughout the 60s was rebuilt almost entirely. Mayfield today is abandoned. Hunts Bank was quickly renamed Victoria and gained its famous facade in 1909. This wall map, by the way, was deliberately misleading leaving off rival services and leading passengers to believe that they could only take Lancashire and Yorkshire railway trains to get about. Eventually, most trains were sent to Piccadilly and Victoria's usage fell. 
It went from 17 platforms to just 6 today, with the building of the arena a huge factor in its decline. Oxford Road was rebuilt in 1960, again from wood, and remains the second busiest in the city centre. And finally, Liverpool Road closed to passengers within years of opening, but was used for goods until the middle of the 20th century. Today, it survives as part of the Science and Industry Museum. So there you go then, a brief history of Manchester's railways, including four major stations, Liverpool Road, London Road, Hunts Bank and Central. Now you might have noticed that none of these names are particularly Mancunian, except perhaps Deansgate. Many were and still are named after the nearest road, Liverpool Road, Oxford Road, which are other cities altogether. Then you have the renaming of London Road to Piccadilly, which is famously a place in London. Now worst of all is the renaming of Hunts Bank to Victoria, as in the Queen. Now I wouldn't mind, but Queen Victoria famously thought very little of Manchester. In fact, she failed to turn up, she refused to turn up for the opening of the Town Hall because the Manchester Corporation had uh, commissioned a statue of Oliver Cromwell and she spat a dummy out about it. Then, <laughs> she only visited the city three times in a reign of 63 years, despite it being one of the most important uh, cities in her empire. But that was the nature of Manchester's leadership in the 19th century, presiding over a city of radical change and radical thinking, but desperate to hold on to very conservative values. And so in the next episode, and yes, I can start calling these episodes now, we'll be staying in the 19th century and looking what life was actually like to live in Manchester during that time. Not for the conservative industrialists or the landowners, but for ordinary working class people, everybody else instead. Uh, so, thanks for watching this video, hope you liked it, like and subscribe, etc, etc, and I'll see you in the next one, bye!